Uh, I will have uh, opening remarks, five minutes, and then we're going to sit with the panelists. I want to thank Jay for organizing this. This is uh, a great opportunity for Paraguay to show what are the things that we are doing and why we think that Paraguay could be the leader on sustainability. Uh, I, I'm sure that most of you have not heard about Paraguay. This is like going to the, an Avatar movie uh, and find out about Pandora, this misplaced in the world uh, that only your imagination can uh, create. Well, this is Paraguay, a country that 150 years ago was the most advanced country in Latin America. And this is the result of centuries of growth, development, but more importantly, it was the connection of the population with the nature. Paraguay, uh, because of the Waranis, who was the indigenous community, and the close linkage to uh, the environment allowed Paraguay to become one of the most advanced countries in Latin America in 1850. But something went wrong. This development made a lot of problems in the region. So in 1864, three countries, Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay, signed a secret treaty, the Triple Alliance War, and they went to a war against Paraguay. So for six years we fought after the six years, we lost 60% of the territory. When you look at the map of Latin America, Mato Grosso do Sur, that belonged to Paraguay. This is one of the most productive areas of Brazil. The northern part of Argentina also belonged to Paraguay. But more importantly, we lose 90% of the population. The human capital uh, that Paraguay has accumulated, all the knowledge has, was lost in a period of six years. So that put Paraguay on hold. Paraguay development was put on hold for over 150 years. And since then, we have been in this process of development. We went through the longest dictatorship in South America, 35 years. And since eight, 1990, we have enjoyed uh, a very prosperous process of development, growth, and democracy in Paraguay. So now we are in a moment that we, we think that Paraguay could lead the process of this new development for Latin America. And there is one advantage because we lost track for the development of other nations and we are lagging behind, we can take this as a great opportunity to learn of what has worked and what has not worked. The type of agriculture that is allowing us to produce food for 100 million people is a type of agricultural development that was only developed 20, 30 years ago with technology that was not available 100 years ago when most of the agriculture in Argentina and Brazil happened. So direct harvesting, rotation of uh, harvests, uh, this is something that is 100% of the production in Paraguay. So when we come to COP and we say that we produce 100 uh, food for 100 million people, but we only contribute 0.1% of all the emissions in the world, it shows that Paraguay is proving to have a more sustainable development. And we raise our voice when international organizations are pushing to implement measures that will force Paraguay to implement the measures that other countries, for the wrongdoing of other countries, many, many decades ago. So Paraguay is not only green because of the land, Paraguay is also blue because despite being a landlocked country, it's a country that is surrounded by huge rivers, huge massive rivers that allow us to mobilize goods. We have the third largest fleet of barges in the world. This is like the Mississippi of South America. And we also allow this water to irrigate the land, the type of uh, the land that allows us to produce all these uh, different crops. And on top of that, we have these massive hydro plants, one that we co-share with Brazil, Itaipu, the largest hydro plant in the world that allow us to use 100% of our electricity is clean and renewable. And we export 80% of the electricity that we produce and we don't consume. We export this to Brazil and Argentina. So we think that uh, this relatively small country in the middle of two giants, uh, Brazil and Argentina, is a great opportunity. And also the political system allows us to be very optimistic in a way that Brazil and Argentina, which are also great countries in terms of food production, but a political system that is very complicated between national authorities and local authorities, this federal system makes very hard to implement from top down the type of policies that will allow sustainability to be only 
to be real and not only on the papers and the declarations. So with this, uh, I want to invite the member of the panel to have a, a, a very lively discussion. Thank you very much. Mr. President, thank you for those op opening remarks and helping this audience know more about Paraguay. Why don't I start with you? Okay. And we'll work our way to the other members of the panel. You've had a storied career. Um, you have been a former central banker. You've been an IMF economist in West Africa, no less. You've published numerous articles. You've taught at the university. If anybody is prepared to achieve exactly what you just described to support uh, the food systems transformation in Paraguay, it's you. And I don't. We just met, so I didn't vote for you because I live in the United States, but I am, have been impressed with your leadership. So here we go. You have... 100, as you said, you have, you provide food for 100 million people, yet you have a significant population that is food insecure. Yes. And so you need to increase your agricultural production. How do you do that using regenerative agriculture? Is that the only tool or is it the primary tool that you will use to move your country forward? Uh, first of all, uh, I think something that is very important, and, and I repeat myself, why do I do what I do? why I'm so passionate of what I'm doing. And, and over my career, uh, and when I was Minister of Finance, uh, I got to this point that I saw of myself, I'm like the Lion King. Now I can do all the good things that I learned in school, what I learned in other countries. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was meeting with uh, senators, members of the Congress, governors, and telling this is what we need to do. Uh, and at some point uh, in these discussions, one of them told me, Okay, so how many boats do you have? You have a lot of these good ideas. How, boat, how many boats do you have? I said, I don't have boats. And I said, no, you do. You have one boat, the boat that the president gave you when he appointed you. You know how hard I work it to be here, to be a member of Congress. Uh, so it doesn't matter how much you know, it how, matter, how you can convince others. If you are able to convince others to vote on you, to trust on you, then you're going to be able to do the things that you think that you could do. So that was the driver for me to get into politics. I'm not a, political, uh, a politician by career, but I am a public policy by career, and, and we know that these things matter. So we need to convince, uh, and this is doing consistency work, and using science, experience, and combine this with the capacity to convince others, mm -hmm. right? So what we think in Paraguay, and this is what we are doing with the team, is bringing together all the government agencies that by definition, they need to work together, but they don't work together. They are all working each other, trying to solve all the problems by themselves. So Paraguay will solve, and I'm committed to, to eradicate hunger. We're going to do that. And this is not a matter that we need more money. Mm -hmm. We need just the money to get where it needs mm -hmm. uh, the most. Well, thank you. Let me go to you, Charlie, uh, from the, <clears throat> as chief executive of the Lloyds Banking Group. Lloyds, as your website says and is reported on Google, is that you're the biggest bank for farmers lending 550 million pounds to UK agriculture in 2022. The, and, and focusing on sustainable farming and, and creating an incentive framework, farmers, despite the, the large investment that you're making, um, continue to face uncertainty and continue to question whether or not regenerative agriculture will provide for them the financial return that is necessary for them to continue to support the growth of their production. How do you answer those questions, and what is Lloyd's doing from a financial standpoint to support bringing more farmers along with us in this regenerative agriculture journey? Great. Well, first of all, President, that was an amazing introduction, so thank you for that. Um, yes, you say, we, we uh, support half the farmers in the UK. Um, we actually lend about $34 billion, $550 million last year, so we, we're a big part of helping farmers 
think about the future, manage their financial resilience and the transition. The starting point, which is why I love the question, is realizing that farmers are at the heart of the problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a very broad range of farmers in different countries, but they go from very small individual families through to some very, very large businesses. And what they all have in common is a real challenge around um, dealing with the uncertainty in the current environments they're operating in. And then when you look at transitioning to more regenerative agricultural processes or practices, typically it creates more uncertainty. Maybe in some cases, depending on where they're starting, multiple years where their income will be lower. So you're asking them to invest in an uncertain set of processes that they or their families haven't been using, move towards a new, new set of pro processes or practices which they don't have experience of generating income and potentially take a dip on the way. So it's, you know, that is at the heart of the problem in most economies that we've been supporting uh, farmers in my career. And in the UK, it's certainly the problem, the, the real issue. There isn't gonna be uh, a single private solution. So we need strong collaboration with government, which is why it was brilliant to hear what you were talking about, President. But um, uh, certainly we're seeing two or three ways that we're trying to work with farmers. The first is, um, providing training and support and data for them to understand the journey they're on, their baseline, and where they're going to. And you know, the data is very, very poor as a starting point. And the level of understanding and tools that are available um, are very poor, certainly in the UK. So we're investing heavily. Actually, we, we have partnered with mm -hmm. an organization called the Soil Association, because soils are the heart of all of the regenerative practices that we know that are going to be important. And it's also part of what I'll come to in a second, which we think is creating a third source of revenue. I'll come back to that in a second. So that's the first thing. The second is partnering with some of the biggest food buyers. So when you look at the supply chains, mm -hmm. increasingly the demand signals coming from big food suppliers, and I'm sure there's some in the room, are starting to value more regenerative agricultural practices. And we can use supply chain financing or reverse supply chain financing to de-risk for the farmers their future demand based on their pivoting towards um, those practices. And so um, McCain's is a great example. I don't know if Max is in the room, but they've been very, very at the forefront of trying to say, how do we lock in um, our suppliers, our farmers, and provide them certainty around their income as they pivot towards more uh, regenerative practices going forward. So that's been really important. Uh, the insurance industry is a big part of that because you can de-risk the transition and create certainty around the demand. Uh, so that's been a really important part of it. And then the third thing, and I'll, I'll then stop, is uh, a recognition. Uh, most farmers, and certainly in uh, many countries, they obviously have the income from the food they sell. They have the income from any government incentives which are in play. And the reality is those two income sources won't provide the returns for that transition period. And so what we're doing is trying to work out how do we create a third source of income. And that's going to be linked to uh, practices around uh, nutrient neutrality, around managing water and floodplains and uh, sequestration of carbon in the soil and then creating a market mm -hmm. where it's credible and where we have data to resell those credits, if you like. Mm -hmm. And that's nascent, but uh, the core of that, again, is understanding the data and having a baseline to be able to create that third income stream. So we've heard from the president the need for policies and leadership from government. You're putting money on the table. Let's go over to you, Grant. Grant Reed, former chair and CEO of Mars, who failed retirement because you're now head of the Sustainable Markets Initiative. Um, and the Sustainable Market Initiative, for those of you who don't know, is committed, it's a, a, a partnership of, um, of the world's leading food and farming businesses and to launch a plan for scaling regenerative agriculture. And you have no small commitment here. Your commitment of the, of the alliance is to bring 40% of all global crop by 2030 into regenerative agriculture. And when you launched, we were at 15%. So we've talked about the, the policy, we talked about the finance, how are you going to get there? Good, so uh, I'm enjoying retirement, and uh, <laughs> uh, so the reason uh, I decided to, to leave Mars and do this is it starts with, um, you know, life and hope, and, you know, the, the trajectory that we're on around the world uh, with climate warming is, is obviously, uh, you know, I don't need to tell this audience, unsustainable. Uh, why did I get interested in agriculture? 
Agriculture is 30% of the greenhouse gas emissions around the world. It's 50% of the habitable land. But more importantly, three quarters of the poor population around the world are tied to agriculture. And they're at the, you know, they're at the front end of this and uh, the least able and least resilient to be able to, to do anything about it. So it's a big task. Um, regenerative agriculture, if you think about it, is in a way, we talked about this with uh, Your Excellency, about it's like going back to the, the mine or indigenous it's that times where you were at one with the soil. Agriculture now is, is extractive and is not sustainable. So what we're talking about is really improving the soil quality. If you do that, you sequester more carbon, you use less water, and it's more sustainable for the farmer, it's more sustainable for, for the planet. So the trajectory is very slow. You know, we're at 15%. We're only increasing one point a year. Mm. Um, and uh, so we wouldn't do it in my lifetime. And so we've really got to triple that and really mm. make a difference. And so there's three waves, and then I'll, I'll, I'll pause. The first wave is the one that you typically know about, the one that I did as I was procurement, chief procurement officer at Mars 20 years ago and worked my way to CEO, is companies doing it on their own. So Mars going into a country, working with uh, local farmers, working with the country. And that's, that's good, that's progress. The second one, a great example you just mentioned, I think Charlie, is McCain working with McDonald's uh, to do a sustainable McFries. The two, so more than one company working together Charlie's uh, going to help us with this and has just joined the, uh, the task force, is a blended finance approach, which is a combination of private, public, and philanthropy working together. That's the only way we're going to get this done. And you need insurance products, you need banking products, and we need to create uh, an asset management class that people can invest in, so there's capital coming in, and at the same time, work with governments to change the way that we compensate and train farmers. So that's the mission. Mm -hmm. uh, you're right, it's a big mission. I think the convening power of His Majesty and the SMI allows this type of uh, forum to get the right people in the room to make it happen. So it's not really about me, my role. I mean, I, I, I've said many times, I don't think I can change the world, but I think I can change my little part of the world. Fantastic. Uh, partnerships, collaboration, blended finance, you brought it all to the table. So let me go to you, Jay, because some would say, why are you sitting here as LTD, as a leader in chemical and agribusiness, in, in the chemical and agribusiness industry? How do you optimize your products to ensure that they are part of the solution for regenerative agriculture? And how do you bring others in the industry alone to, along to ensure that we, what we have is not just one company, because it's been said by several of the other panel members, that it requires collaboration? And so you are, you stepped out there in, 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 as, a, as, as a leader in your industry uh, to say there's a way forward. What is that way forward? Thank you. Um, you know, great pleasure to be here and really gr great to see the Emirates Declaration, which really brings uh, agriculture as one of the key tools to also be a key partner to, to uh, fight climate change and, uh, and really be a, a, a pillar in, in this fight. Um, so far, agriculture was uh, ignored or even seen as a, as a villain, uh, and as, as we know, 30% is generated from agriculture. So uh, at uh, UPL, you know, we are uh, a company started in India working with small farmers, uh, and as through my career, uh, as we saw uh, farmers really suffering the worst end of climate change, uh, there is no other industry, there is no other community, there is no other business community which gets impacted more by climate change. A 15-day window change in weather doesn't impact anybody else more than a farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at uh, the, the, the weather patterns, uh, we only on TV see cars floating down 
uh, rivers. Even a couple of weeks ago in Dubai, we had cars uh, drowned uh, with rain. But these are extreme things which we see. A 15-day variation, 20-day variation in, in rainfall uh, impacts livelihoods of farmers. Mm. And, uh, you know, coming from India, working in Africa, working with smallholder farmers in South America and everywhere else, these, these guys get wiped out. Their, their uh, whole uh, investment gets wiped out. And uh, um, uh, as, uh, as uh, a, a person who sells technology and products to farmers, we felt the need that this has to be changed. Uh, this has to be. So UPL, ha over the last 10 years, has invested in technologies which improve farmer resilience. Mm -hmm. So our whole focus is how do we make a farmer more resilient how do we create an ecosystem where he improves soil health, whether it is uh, or uh, really uh, can, can survive these weather changes? And uh, so over the years, we've learned that there's enough technology out there to, to improve agriculture efficiency, reduce uh, impact. And I'll, I'll, I'll go on to say that every farmer can improve 10%. Uh, 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 reduce 10% emissions. Every farmer. There's enough technology out there uh, where every farmer in the world, and if you're saying it's And I not only believe that, that uh, sustainable agriculture will, will reduce emissions, but it also will increase productivity. And we cannot feed 10 billion people by cutting forests. Mm -hmm. So we need to adopt technology. We need to reward farmers. We need to recognize farmers. And it's great, uh, all these alliances where uh, sustainable uh, farmers, uh, uh, farmers who follow regenerative practices will uh, will make more money or will be recognized for, for behavior. Uh, saying that, I, I, I believe that, uh, that this whole transition is at level zero, right? We didn't get EVs overnight. EV revolution started 20 years ago. Today, we have fancy EVs which drive 500 kilometers. <laughs> 20 years ago, they did tw 50 kilometers. We are at level zero uh, in agriculture. We can get in 10 years. your family's wealth or your annual income because we want a greener world. You can't ask them. That's mm -hmm. just not fair. So, so we uh, at UPL are, are really committed to bringing technologies. And, and we are so excited to partner with Paraguay because uh, as soon as I uh, met uh, President uh, Pina uh, in Paraguay, he said, committed. We will be uh, uh, driving sustainable technology. It's a nice-sized country. It has commercial agriculture. And our commitment is to work with the government to convert 25% of the pasture lands, 25% of the agriculture lands to sustainable regenerative mm -hmm. practices. So uh, it's, it's really nice to see the whole, uh, uh, I would say, awakening of, of, of so many uh, uh, organizations, governments, and, and places like COP where uh, agriculture now is the center for it because I think this is the last tool uh, to decarbonize the world or to, to also last pillar mm -hmm. to help, uh, uh, you know, uh, fight this, uh, this challenge. Well, thank you very much for that, Jay. And the, the leadership that United Phosphorus Limited, UPL, is demonstrating is the reason that we know agribusiness must be a part of the solution. And you've taken up that mantle by, as you just uh, outlined, with new technologies that bring more knowledge to farmers to help them perform better uh, and more efficiently. Uh, and supports the regenerative agriculture, their regenerative agriculture practices. But you also made a point of saying 
cutting down forests, we won't get there. So that gets me to Ariana, who is the founder and CEO of Forested. And Forested's mission is to conserve the world's uh, biodiversity and ecosystems. Ariana, you've been quoted as saying that you want to become the Cargill for deforestation for, for, and for regenerative agriculture. What does that mean? Yeah, so definitely a lot of um, similar threads of, um, you know, the need for coalition building, more data financing, um, which actually informs a lot of where we're going. Um, so to, to introduce Forested, we are an ingredient in SETS marketplace. Um, for those of you who know about carbon offsets, um, insetting in comparison to offsetting is when companies actually reduce their carbon footprint through their own supply chains. Um, so what we do is we work with community-led conservation groups, um, so smallholders who, yes, have one to two hectares of land, but we're specifically working on um, the territories of land where 50 to 300 farmers kind of jointly manage these pristine um, forests and other ecosystems. Um, and so I did use, once upon a time, I did go around saying that we are the Cargill for deforestation free ingredients, not to say that Cargill is, you know, deforesting, um, but our dream was to work with, you know, millions of farmers across the global south, set up lots of factories and bring those products to market. Um, and so even though we do do some of that right now, um, as I mentioned, we are a marketplace because we've been doing a lot of listening, um, listening to the community led conservation groups that we work with. Um, as well as the CPG buyers that we are also supplying and just hearing that there's kind of a market player missing who has one foot in the door of understanding how difficult it is for procurement professionals to procure their critical raw materials, but also access the environmental benefits that they're setting their net zero nature positive claims around. Um, and then on the other side of the world, we have indigenous forest communities who, you know, many of which are not connected to the grid, don't have smartphones, but they need incentives to keep their ecosystems intact. Um, I think we can all agree here that smallholders know more than anyone the importance of their environments. But, you know, we're, we're out here saying, I think a report last week um, from the Crowther Lab just reinforced that biodiverse forests are one third um, of the climate solution, but if the indigenous and local land stewards who are quite literally living in these forests don't have the financial incentives or means to keep these ecosystems intact, um, then how can we expect them to be, you know, play the role that they have the potential to in our climate um, solution around nature? So what we do at Forested is work with community-led conservation groups um, across East Africa. I personally have spent the last nine years in Ethiopia and the rest of my team um, on, the, on the borders of the Congo, Kenya, Tanzania. Um, and what we do is we capacitate community-led conservation groups to further commercialize the beautiful ingredients that live in their forests. So bee products, gums, resins, oils, butters, seaweed. Um, and ultimately we bring them to market to um, CPGs. And I think one thing we're really excited about is um, I guess the a lot of the growing ambition we're seeing with CPGs um, and um, one uh, kind of one case for insetting is that when we look at consumer packaged goods companies, 80% of their carbon emissions are scope three. Um, more than 90% of their impact on nature is in supply chains. And finally, over 75% of their impact on jobs is in supply chains. Um, and so that's why Forested is um, really working to pioneer ingredients as an insetting solution, essentially to help CPGs regenerate their supply chains in a way that actually works for people on the ground and the planet. Well, thank you very much. You are taking on the big task there. But many would argue that the biggest task is financing and to the financing the scale up. And so I'm going to ask one question and ask each one of you to, get, to give a quick response. And um, we will hopefully, hopefully uh, tease the audience into, into maybe asking a question if we have enough time. Ms. We'll start with you, Mr. President, because, and I'm starting with you because when we talk about finance, many people will say we need the policy ecosystem to support the flow of capital. 
what does that mean as a former finance minister for you in order to what type of policies do you think are necessary that you are looking to put in place that will help bring more capital into investment in regenerative agriculture in Paraguay? I think financing is important, but financing by itself is not going to solve the problems. Uh, so we're working very close with the multilateral institutions, uh, helping them how to help better uh, countries in Latin America. Uh, Paraguay will become the second country to have a program with the IMF with this new facility, the Resilience and Sustainability Facility. So uh, the only one now is Costa Rica. Paraguay is going to be the second one in two weeks. We already reached an agreement with the FAN. Uh, we are working with the IDB on a pilot program, a climate uh, program uh, with other three countries, and Paraguay one of the one of these, these four countries. So the idea here is how to align government programs to the interests of the multilateral institution mm -hmm. and to make the appropriate incentive. I mean, um, if you think about the role of multilateral institutions, they were very successful in helping accessing market for different countries. We all have, I mean, by Paraguay was the last country in South America to access the international markets. Mm -hmm. We have access now. We are one notch below investment grade. So the benefit is not access in market. It's access in market in different conditions or in better conditions that will allow, allow you to implement more projects on sustainability. So uh, this is a two-way uh, avenue. And, and I think that we are pushing from our side. And because uh, I myself have an experience in multilateral institutions, the Ministry of Economy, the Chief of Cabinet, we all work in multilateral uh, institutions in Latin America. So uh, we are really chasing them and saying, you need to adapt your tools for countries. Otherwise, the countries are not going to be able to implement mm -hmm. uh, all these uh, very ambitious programs. So we think that Paraguay will be, again, uh, leading in this process. And we can show the path to other countries, uh, many of them who have access to market and other countries who has absolutely no access to market mm -hmm. financing. Mm -hmm. So... Let me go over to you, Grant, uh, as our banker. Uh, what are the policies I think that Charlie's you, the banker. I'm sorry. Charlie's I'm the, the banker. I'm the banker, yeah. Yeah, I was making have a go at me. The, have a go at you. Uh, sorry about that, uh, Grant. Charlie, what policies uh, do you look for from governments in order to support capital flows? I know most of your investment is in the UK itself, but that too. Uh, you look for a policy environment and policy support for your investment in regenerative. What policies are necessary? Yeah, so the first thing I agree, um, although everyone talks about finance, uh, I agree finance isn't the solution by itself. I always think finance, uh, and I'm very humble about the role that finance plays, we're there to support uh, the entrepreneurs, the businesses, the farmers, and the government actually in this context. And you really have to have investable projects or changes in practices mm -hmm working together with new ways of doing regenerative agriculture that pay off. Otherwise, financing can create problems. It can actually create inequality and or problems further into the future. So um, I don't think finance is the solution, but it is going to be the oil or it is going to be bad use of a word in this context. It is going <laughs> to be the enabler that enables us uh, to really transition quickly. Um, the alignment with government is was your question mm -hmm. is really important. There is about four hundred billion dollars worth of government incentives around agriculture in the world, heavily biased towards the northern developed markets, but nonetheless there is about four hundred billion dollars, um, and the they differ massively by country. Having alignment around what incentives are helping really help farmers make the transition, and then making sure sure we get the right outcomes is one of the debates that needs to be had. So, for example, in some countries, and the UK is one, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of thought being put into how, we, how do we encourage more uh, biodiversity and better nature outcomes and carbon outcomes in agriculture. But for many farmers, that means it's easier to achieve with producing less food. So they go back to rewilding or they go to forestry. And that isn't the outcome. The objective I think we've all agreed to is, you know, we need to produce more food, in fact, mm -hmm. to support the world and we need to do it in a much much more uh, nature friendly and carbon friendly way so the the details around how government aligns their incentives and the demand uh, incentives is really really important and then uh, recognizing for different types of farmers and implementing either different technologies or different practices what is their challenge and how do you finance the gap 
And as I said, the real challenge for so many farmers is there's going to be a dip in income uh, as they get to a different way of uh, farming for maybe two or three years. And we on the SMI always talk about there's only five more harvests before 2030. Mm -hmm. So this is not the problem of tomorrow. This is a very, very uh, immediate issue. If you're going to have a different set of uh, agricultural outcomes by 2030, if you're not starting to farm and change your practices next season or the season after, you're not going to get to a more regenerative practice. So how do you finance that dip? That's going to take public and private finance working together. You know, use the phrase blended finance. Mm -hmm. uh, we also think in many countries, many locations, it's going to require philanthropy mm -hmm. to get involved. And the good news is philanthropy really wants to get involved. They see this as one of the most important systems to change as part of our transition to net zero. So I, I, you all are disagreeing with me that finance is not the most important thing. Uh, but that's a good thing. Uh, but I would come now to you, Grant, because as a leader of SMI, and that big hairy goal of getting from 15 to 40 percent in five seasons, what are the policies that are necessary to support that scale up and that rapid change? Yeah, so um, I would say, that, you know, the, the other panelists, I think, have been very articulate in, in many of these spaces, and I completely agree. Uh, the finance is important, but it starts with what is it you're actually compensating and what, are, what is it you're trying to measure? So the, 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 the bullseye starts with common metrics. Do we know what we're asking farmers to do? Do we know how to fa measure it? Are we asking them to do too many things? So keep it nice and simple. And once you do that, then you can work on financing the transition. And the government policy should be really uh, focused on rewarding farmers for the transition and providing the environmental outcomes that they're looking for. Uh, so I think there's the first pay for what you want because now we know what to measure. Um, but there's also a lot of other things they can be doing on agricultural training. You know, how do we actually... get others to follow that. It's, it's a clear path, but it's a complex path. And I think that's, that's going to be the balance. A clear path, but a complex path. Yeah. That gets us back to you, my friend. As we, you talked about bringing knowledge to farmers through new tools, new, tech, new technological tools. The reality is many of those tools, uh, smallholders and poor and indigenous farmers can't afford them. How do we build the policies and the finance to ensure that we have outreach uh, that will bring all farmers along to prosperity from regenerative agriculture? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, it's, it's a huge challenge uh, um, working in a, in a food system with, uh, you know, we have five cycles uh, for 2030, maybe in tropical countries we have 10 cycles. In some of the other countries we may have a few. individual who takes all his capital every year and sticks it into his farm and then prays uh, that nothing goes wrong. Um, at, at what we are doing at UD, UPL, uh, and we are doing it in now four or five countries, where we, if a farmer commits to sustainable technologies, we automatically ensure, uh, using all satellite technology, automatically ensure his risk. If there is bad weather, he, whatever he's invested in, he gets paid out instantly within seven days of the event. Mm -hmm. We've we've given away uh, small packets of insurance uh, to hundreds of thousands of farmers. So what happens is we are te te telling the farmer that please adopt to these practices, and if something.
to pay you a little bit more. Uh, nothing drives farmers uh, uh, more than that. I believe that in many parts of the farmers have lost confidence in, in carbon credits, right? Farmer has droughts, floods, rains, so many other issues. And then you ask him that, please maintain your land records for next five years, and I will give you carbon credits. It's very, very difficult to predict. Tell a farmer who's fighting for survival, saying, I need to have another barometer, so I'm borrowing money. So we, I believe that a reward system for sustainable behavior, which ends in that same crop cycle, is far more executable and less risky. Um, also, uh, on some of these uh, long-term validation projects, the cost of managing, cost of monitoring is very, very high. And, and so the farmer gets a very small portion of the carbon credit sold. And some of these things uh, need to be addressed and sorted out so that the reward system is efficient so the farmer gets the most amount of money. And, and he gets some kind of cover for risk. Uh, and that will drive adoption. Mm -hmm. We have uh, 22 sugar mills in India who have transitioned who are committed to transitioning. That's about 400,000 acres. That's just in a year. We believe that uh, there is about 5 million hectares of sugarcane in India. And, and that uh, they are promising to reduce about 30% of uh, emissions from there. So it can be quite huge. But we need to support them with some kind of uh, cover uh, to, uh, to, to aggressively adopt uh, transition. So we need to support them, support the farmers with income. And that, that Ariana, let me come over to you because uh, as we talk about conservation of forests and we talk about the policies that are necessary to support conservation of forests, some would say the policies that are necessary would be uh, penalties. Others say we need the kinds of rewards and support that would catalyze farmers and, and provide the financial support that is necessary for them to help with conservation. What do you think are the right policies to ensure that conservation as a part of regenerative agriculture is an effective tool? In some ways, um, policies or kind of a similar government structure we've seen across East Africa and really the global south is um, a structure of participatory forest management groups. Um, so it's it's been very cool as we've expanded out of Ethiopia across East Africa to realize that um, there are these similar structures where community members are um, brought together almost like farmer cooperatives, but with the core mission to conserve their ecosystem. Um, so on in Ethiopia, they're called participatory forest management groups. We're also working with um, similar structures in Kenya on the coast called beach management. ways that has worked for us um, but but I do want to address the finance piece because it is a it is a sore spot for us um, finance is very much the lifeblood of agribusiness um, and you know while we need finance I would say what's what's equally as important is having the right financial partner you know having the right financier is is like the the necessary grease that you need to just do a business that's already incredibly difficult um, so we at Forested are actually really excited about um, finance and are actually working our, on our own innovative finance tools. So we are, um, you know, based off of the challenges that we've heard from, um, you know, being a trading company, working with other um, community-led conservation producers and agribusinesses is just how difficult it is to get working capital, even trade finance to, you um, you know, with, with inventory invoicing. And so um, we're designing um, a pollinator bond called B-Bond, um, but basically we are designing a bond-based debt structure um, to promote native African pollinator abundance for food security and for conservation outcomes, um, but to actually deploy that capital in a working capital facility, um, ultimately to, as we've discussed, you know, decrease the necessary risk that it takes for farmers to keep conserving their ecosystems and also transition to regenerative um, and kind of splice the market where, you know, big financial institutions are like, we want to invest in nature, but they have like 50 to 100 million dollars. But the real nature-based solutions are, 
you know, coming in the form of these small, medium agribusinesses who maybe need 50K here, 100K here, maybe a million, um, and really design an innovative debt financing tool that can, you know, serve the increasing demand for nature products in institutional markets, but actually be effective in the transition to regenerative that we need and that smallholder farmers can actually absorb. So getting nature, getting, getting us paid for saving nature, that's, that's, that, that seems, seems simple, but if it was, we would have done it already, right? Um, we have about five minutes left. So I want to start with you, Mr. President, and ask each one of you, what hurdle must we overcome to achieve a regenerative agriculture system that will achieve the sustainable transformation of the food system that's required for our environment, as well as for human health and for the financial return for all actors, particularly for farmers? We need courage, determination, and, and we need to break this inertia that we're going meeting after meeting without taking the appropriate actions. Great answer. We need to courage. That's a great. We need more politicians like you who are willing to admit courage is necessary. Yeah. All right, let's go over to you, Glenn. I I I know. Um, I'm sorry, Charlie, and because I know that uh, you are a banker. But uh, what do you think we need? Well, it, it's going to be similar. There isn't a silver bullet, and just you've heard from the breadth of discussions here. The, the interventions we need, the collaboration across sectors and then between private and public sector and the different types of finance. Um, we haven't, I can see some of my colleagues in the room, we haven't even talked about natural capital properly yet, means there is no silver bullet. So for me, it's going to be this mindset shift and it's going to be the courage, as you use your word, or the, the willingness and the ambition uh, to be bold. Uh, because it's going to require that action across a very broad set of stakeholders. And that's why I think that we've been behind in this transition. When we look at the different transitions the world is committed to, this transition and the built environment actually are the two that I think are lagging the most. So mm. it's going to require a mindset and a boldness that we haven't seen. And the harsh reality is there is no silver bullet. Courage, boldness, and recognizing there's no silver bullet. Grant, over to you. Yeah, so great input so far. Um, I think we need to uh, move away from commitments and move to delivery and consequences if that delivery is not achieved. And if you wanted it in one, one word, pace. We, we just have to move at pace. Well, there's no more time. Jay, you've heard yes. it. Courage, boldness, no silver bullet, move at pace. No, what I think, do you say? I think we've achieved a, a huge step here by at this COP. Uh, three COPs ago, I think agriculture was not even a subject to discuss. I think today it is. So I'm, I'm very encouraged. I think this is a fantastic uh, achievement. Um, I believe that every, every grower can produce 10% more reduce 10% uh, emissions. It's there, technology exists. Just think about the aviation industry. They're talking about 1% uh, SAF, which is sustainable aviation fuel, 1%. Uh, I am pretty sure that uh, a target like 10% across the world with the leadership of all the countries who've signed up to this can easily be achieved. I, I don't see a, a problem at all. And uh, I think we need reward and recognition for farmers. Reward and recognition for farmers. All right, Ariana, courage, <laughs> boldness, no silver bullet, pace, reward and recognition for farmers. What say ye? I say radically transparent partnership. Um, because at the end of the day, we can't really help each other unless we actually understand the problems that each, you know, each partner is dealing with. Um, and I just definitely want to give a shout out to one of our initial partners, Lush Cosmetics. Um, you know, we know that regenerative agriculture is very expensive. And so what we did was opened our books to them, told them the cost of goods sold, agreed upon a healthy gross margin that an ingredient supplier should get, and asked them how that stacked against what they pay in the market. And kind of likewise, you know, after we started supplying them with forest honey, they opened up their books for us 
and they say, hey, this, these are the top 50 ingredients with the highest carbon footprint. What can you guys do about it? And because of that radical transparency, um, you know, we're now working on several supply chains, but are helping them regenerate um, their almond oil supply with an endemic um, species on the coast of Kenya and Tanzania that, you know, if we get this um, alternative nut oil to market, it can help conserve mangrove ecosystems as well as restore these coastlines. So give me one word. Radical transparency. Radical transparency. So courage, boldness, no silver bullet pace. That what was yours? <laughs> Reworking uh, or rewarding farmers. Reward and recognition. Reward and recognition of farmers. I can't read my own handwriting. And radical, radical. Radical transparency. transparency. Mr. President, Jay, Ariana, Charlie, and my friend Grant, who I will never call you a banker again. <laughs> I, I didn't take it as an insult. I took it as a compliment. <laughs> I, I do now think it was an insult. <laughs> Thank you for that. With the, with the courage that you all have for performing the work every day, and the boldness and the, the desire to move us quickly with providing the rewards to farmers as well as the radical transparency that is necessary, we will achieve a more regenerative agriculture system that supports our sustainable transformation of the food system. I thank you all for your work and not just for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.